Good morning. Welcome to St. James. I don't know what's going on here. This is kind of weird, but maybe it'll uh, fill up. Maybe I'll, I'll put my head down and pray here in a second, and it'll fill up while, while we're praying. Um, welcome to all you guys. Welcome to everybody who's watching on the live stream. If I can, oh, so uh, the, uh, the attendance, the guest registers are at the end of your aisle. If you could fill that out and then pass that along. There's a QR code on the back of the bulletin if you want to take the attendance uh, digitally. Also, there's QR codes around here if you want to um, have access to the bulletin digitally as well. So uh, fill the book out, though, or or don't fill it out and pass it along so that the people next to you can also fill it out as well. Uh, Today, uh, finally, we're back on schedule for everything today. We have um, evening prayer tonight at 5.30 and the new members class right after that at 6. And again, as always, anybody who, who wants to is welcome to show up to that and hang out with us. Um, Tuesday, uh, men's Bible study at 6.30. I'm going to announce this today because we're starting a new study. We finished uh, uh, one and we're starting a new one and it's going to be a 10-week study on uh, the Proverbs and uh, that's starting this Tuesday at 6.30 in the morning. And, and if you want to be a part of that, let me know, and I will get you one of the study guides. If you are, if, for those of you who are already in the class, don't leave today without getting one of those uh, from me. I got them in the mail this week, so I'll get it to you on um, today, and then um, we can have the next, uh, uh, the, the first chapter ready to discuss on Tuesday morning at 6.30. Uh, Wednesday evening, uh, great divorce, uh, back on. Please uh, get a hold of me. Um, if you want to participate in that, we're reading, for those of you who are in there, we're reading chapter nine and talking about that this Wednesday. Okay, now uh, here's uh, uh, this, something that's kind of important I want to point out is this, is that um, next Sunday is going to be uh, uh, different. It's going to be a little bit weird next Sunday. Uh, not weird, uh, good. Uh, one of the things we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing a lot of things in here, and one of them is um, youth confirmation. Uh, we're going to be confirming the youth confirmands. Uh, recognition of the seniors from last year and this year, and also a baptism. But also after church, what we're going to do during the Bible study hour, I'm going to politely ask all of you to hang around. We're going to go downstairs, and we're going to, uh, there's going to be cake, and we're going to recognize the confirmands and the graduates. And then we're going to transition into um, our first ever ministry fair here, which a lunch will be provided And uh, what's going to happen is, and I mentioned this last week, what's going to happen is is that um, there's uh, all the different uh, deacons and deaconess groups are going to have some sort of setup down there where you can sort of meander around and talk to each one of these groups about uh, how you can serve at St. James. uh, I've preached about this before. I made comments about it last week, so I don't want to belabor the point too much. But just to say this is that church is not like a once a week spectator thing where, you know, you got to put your money in the offering plate in order to participate. But then, you, you know, you come and you sing some songs and you hear a sermon. Like this is, we, we are, mostly we're described not as a gathering in the New Testament, but as a family or as a body. And so uh, each one of you has been called and brought here to this church for a lot of different reasons. But one of the reasons is, is that you've been gifted by the Holy Spirit to love and serve this congregation and many of you, you don't know how, you, you have not done that. And so you're not really sure what that would look like or what your gifts would be. Ministry fair is a good way to start finding that out. Now, I know some of you are like, I can't do that. I'm just so busy. I, I know that. Not all of you. Some of you will be like super involved. <clears throat> not all of you will be super involved because you have other vocations. A lot of you have kids. And that means you spend a lot of time doing that. And that's good and appropriate. But at least something, at least something, there are a lot of ministries around here where there's just small things that need to be done. And we do so many different things around here that are going to match up with each one of the gifts that all of us have. And so um, it's not all teaching, it's not all like taking care of kids. Uh, The music program, if you're a musician, the music program is always looking for musicians. Um, uh, Larry will be here to talk about, and Devin, to talk about internet technology, website stuff. If that's your thing, uh, there's mercy ministry stuff going on. There's altar guilt stuff going on. So a lot of it's not super time consuming, so don't be scared. Um, but just come and eat lunch with us and hang out, and nobody's going to be pressuring you to sign up for anything. But it's a chance to walk around and see what's going on at church and to be talking to people. See, we find our spiritual gifts not by taking some sort of like Cosmo-style quiz where you figure out like who, what's your spiritual gift, but you do it in relationship and in ministry 
And this is one of the best ways to do it, I think, or best way, best way to start to do it is to have these conversations next Sunday. So plan on hanging around after church uh, for a little bit next Sunday, and we'll have a good time. It'll be super casual. There won't, I'm not going to preach another sermon down there or anything like that. Just eat lunch and talk to people. That'll be next Sunday, uh, May 22nd. Okay, that's all I want to say for right now. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll sing the opening hymn. forgot to mention, some of you don't care at all, but some of you are wondering why I'm not wearing uh, my alb, and uh, I, I forgot it. I preached somewhere else on Wednesday, and I forgot it, and it's at that church, and I didn't remember, so we're just going to have to cope with me wearing this today. I know some of you are totally, didn't, didn't even realize I wasn't wearing a robe, but if, if you were, and you were troubled for whatever reason, that's why it's happening. Okay, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, Forgive me all my sins and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray, God Almighty, to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. 
He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. of two Old Testament readings this morning is from Genesis chapter 2, right after uh, the creation of the world in Genesis 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second is from Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, and uh, clearly evokes what we just read from Genesis 2. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy is the fourth commandment, uh, the third commandment. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 23 and 24. Glory to you, O Lord. It's the story of Jesus' uh, burial and resurrection. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I just realized as I was standing there uh, singing that I uh, made you stand up through the Old Testament reading. And again, I'm just like full of uh, faux pas, liturgical faux pas today. I apologize, forgive me. I owe, I, I owe you one. I will let you sit at some, uh, some extra portion. Uh, okay, so um, there's a famous quote by Luther. Oh, actually, before we do that, before I get in the sermon, let me just tell you where we're going for the next few days. Um, well, this is going to be a little bit weird. I wanted to preach a, a short sermon series on Sabbath, and um, uh, because I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. And it, end, it ended up being, there's a lot of juicy stuff in here. It's going to be three weeks, and they're all going to have three different emphasis. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Sabbath, how, how it relates to creation. And then next week, we're going to talk about Sabbath, how it relates to redemption. And then on the third Sunday, we're going to talk about Sabbath and how it relates to restoration, the future Sabbath that God has planned for us as people in the new creation. However, uh, there was a lot of stuff in here, and I, I, I already preached. You don't have to look at me like that. I already preached a long time, I know. But one of the problems that I was running into is that next week, I'm going to have to preach a super short sermon because we have youth confirmation, recognition of the, uh, um, uh, uh, of the graduates, and then Winston Rapp's baptism, and I don't want to bump into the ministry fair. And so what I did was, is I pulled a sermon that I was working on for Ascension, which is a super important topic um, in, in, in relationship to, to you and I in our Christian lives now, Jesus' Ascension. I'm going to pull that from like the Ascension week, a couple weeks hence, and do that next Sunday. I think I can do a short sermon on that. And so I'm going to start, this is just weird, and I just met, I, I, again, faux pas, that's my so I have that printed on my business card. Um, starting the sermon series on Sabbath today, taking a break, for, uh, a break for Ascension next week, and then getting back to the Sabbath uh, series the week after that. So a little bit weird, but that's kind of where we headed. I just thought you guys would want to head a heads up. Uh, anyway, to the sermon. There's this famous quote by Luther that says this. He says this, If I profess with loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God except the little point 
which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. So basically what he means is this. You can say all kinds of like good stuff from God's word, true stuff, but if it's not addressing the moment and the needs that we all have, even if it's true, it's not really preaching the whole counsel of God. In the, in, in the churches that I grew up in, we would have preachers that would come in every once in a while. I don't ever remember having a pastor that was really bad at this. But we preachers come in, you know, and preach a sermon against stuff that everybody in the church already agreed with, you know. And um, there's a certain sort of like rah-rah, hooray for our side uh, kind of vibe behind that, behind that. But it doesn't really help you. It doesn't, it, you already know this. It's something that you... you it's true, maybe, but you're already solid on it. And all it does is create sort of an atmosphere of we're right and they're wrong. So I could, I could preach a sermon against the Methodist today and things about uh, Ar Arminian or Wesleyan theology that I don't agree with. And it would be true, but the problem, of course, is that most of you aren't Methodist. Most of you aren't Arminians or Wesleyans. And so it would just be like we're better than Bethel across the street, which is true, of course, uh, naturally. <laughs> But it doesn't really benefit us in the moment. And thinking through like the things that, I, that you and I need to be discussing and talking about, Sabbath actually is super important. And my, my emphasis here is not going to be on, I want to talk about this morning because I kind of have to. It's a question that some of you have. My emphasis is not on Sunday morning worship. That's important. My emphasis is on Sabbath as this large biblical principle of rest and not being owned by and a slave to work which is a massive American problem. So much so, so here, here's some, there are certain things going on in our culture that all of you guys are like, that's evil, man. I see this happening on social media. It's wrong. I'm coming out against that. That's good. That's appropriate. But the issue of work and rest is actually a, a much larger attack by Satan that none of us are really aware of because we've all sort of imbibed the American dream that through work and diligence, you can actually save yourself. I mean, no, no Christian would talk like that, but it's really the way we think. And so I want to spend a few weeks talking about Sabbath and what it means for how we relate to God and how we relate to our work, our vocations. When I say work, I don't just mean the way that you make money, but the work of, uh, you, you know, taking care of your home and your kids and your family and, and the work that you do around church, for instance, things like that, the work that you do in your community, how do we relate to those things? And so let's start off today by talking about Sabbath and creation. Sabbath goes all the way back to creation. We read in Genesis 2, 1 through 3. I'll read it again. It's in your bulletin. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. In case you were wondering what the emphasis there is, God does all this work. And then he chooses a day at the end of this week to rest. He says he makes it holy. He sets it apart. He blesses it and says this day is going to be special because we know from the rest of the story he's going to pause and he's going to enjoy the goodness of the creation that he just made. God's very, very impressed with the goodness of this beautiful creation that he's made. And he's going to take it. He's going to take a day out and he's going to enjoy it. Okay, so obviously I think we know from the rest of the scripture that God doesn't get tired. We know this one of the prophets, I should have looked this up, says something along the lines of like, God is not a man that he would get weak. Uh, to, to, you know, it's not talking about creation there. It's talking about God's ability to save us. He's not like an army where, you know, once the army tires out, you're like, well, our country's done. God's not like that. God never gets weak. So what does it mean that God would rest? That God would take six days to create the universe, and then on the seventh day he would rest. If he doesn't get tired, why does he need to rest? Just a few, uh, just a few preliminary comments about this from what we know about God and what we know about this story. First of all, I think that we can say this. God is not a workaholic. God works. He's a worker. He's the greatest worker in the history of the universe, most efficient worker. But God is not a workaholic. He is not defined by his work. Work is not who he is. He does work, but it's not who he is. He's also in relationship. He's also an enjoyer. He's a rester. He's not just a worker. He, he does work, but that's not his identity. 
The well-being of creation does not depend on endless work. Creation, the universe running, does not depend upon a workaholic being there, making it go. God can rest. Second thing I want to say about this. The setting apart of a rest day to enjoy the other six days, the setting apart of the seventh day to rest and enjoy the other six days means that the other six days have value. I'm going to come back to this later in the sermon when I talk about us. Let me just point this out now, is that God doesn't say, okay, I'm done. I created Adam and Eve, six day over. Okay, what's, what's going on next? What are we going to do next? God pauses to look back at the work that he's done and say, that is good. That is good. It takes a Sabbath to stop and say, you know what? What I did has value. And God takes a Sabbath to enjoy and recognize the value of what he did. Third thing, the work of creation, this is kind of a backwards look at the, the, the second thing I just said. Third thing is this. The work of creation was not, is not an end in itself. Its goal was for God to enjoy it. So sometimes we like to talk about humans as like the apex of creation. You know, God, light, the planets, you know, earth, water, birds, squirrels, trees, stuff like that. Human beings, final day, and especially woman. You know, God looks at creation and says it's not good, and he makes Eve. So let's say that, that humans, especially female, is the apex of, of God's creation. And yet, day six is not the end of it. There's a day seven where God says, now I'm going to enjoy what I've done. What does that mean? It means that God creates the whole world to get to this seventh day so he can enjoy what he's done. The apex of creation is not any part of creation, actually. The apex of creation is God's personal enjoyment of you and me and the squirrels and the fish and whatnot, trees and whatnot. In other words, the apex of creation leads back to God himself. Creation was made for God to enjoy. And everything, look, so, so everything that we can ever say, you and I can ever say in conversation from here on out about any part of creation, food, sex, jobs, vacations, shoelaces, squirrels, trees, whatever, it all has to revolve and, come and, and find its meaning in the God who made each one of those things for his own personal enjoyment. I know it might be weird for us to think of shoelaces in terms of objects of worship. And this is exactly what they are. There's not a single thing that God has invented in creation whose purpose is not to bring him honor and glory, to bring him enjoyment. And Sabbath is the one way that you get that, where God stops at the end of this, you know, the, the, the six days at the beginning of creation and says, I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to relax, and I'm going to enjoy what I've done. All right. Now, let's go to Exodus 20, the other Old Testament reading. What does this mean for us? In Exodus 20, this is the Ten Commandments, of course. One of the commandments that God gives his people is this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or anybody else. You're not, not your workers, not your animals, not the sojourners, not the immigrants who are coming, you know, who, are, who are within your uh, region. Verse 11, because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In other words, God called his people Israel to set apart the Sabbath day to make it holy because that's what he did. That's what he did. Now, have you ever thought about the, the Sabbath commandment? Like, the other commandments all sort of make sense as commandments. Like, don't kill. That's a great rule. It's just a great solid rule. All right, that makes sense. But now you get the Sabbath day, don't work. It seems like a little bit out of place. It doesn't really fit in with all the other ones, which are, I think that, that to, to most people, who, who, well, to all, everybody's made in the image of God. I think most people intuitively understand, because they're made in the image of God, that it's wrong to kill people. It's wrong to steal stuff from other people. It's wrong to despise and hate and anger your parents. These sorts of things are just basically sort of intuitive across human culture because all humans are designed to look like God. Sabbath, though, is one that it's not necessarily intuitive. One of the reasons why we have a hard time understanding this is because we tend to think of God's commandments in terms of harming other people. Like God gives his commands so that we don't harm other people. And so, you know, don't murder, that makes sense because murder is harming other people. 
But th- we have, what do you do then with like the, the coveting commandment? That doesn't harm other people. You say, well, it harms us. Because what about Sabbath then? We get to Sabbath. Well, who does that harm? All right. Once we start asking that question, which is, you know, what kind of laws, the, 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 the laws that protect us from harming other people and protect ourselves are the most important. We've actually lost sight of what the law actually is. The law is basically this. God created us to look like him, so he wants us to look like him, right? I mean, the main reason that we don't murder people is not because it's mean and does damage. That's true. That's, and, and if that keeps you from murdering people, that's a good start. But the main reason that we don't murder people is because God is a life-giving God, and so we are to be people who protect and preserve life as well because we're supposed to look like him. It's actually, the, 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 the main point of reference is not necessarily our neighbors. The main point of reference is the character of God, the being of God. And in, in that light, Sabbath makes more sense. If God is a God who works six days and then takes the Sabbath to rest, we should be a, we should be a people who works six days and then takes the Sabbath to rest as well. So God's people in the Old Testament did this. They, they, they celebrated Sabbath. It was a part of who they were. I know that some of you right now are thinking, okay, so does Sunday, is that the Sabbath? Can you do me a favor and not think about that for a few minutes? So many times the Christian church has gotten sidetracked when talking about the Sabbath to debate stuff like, well, is the, is the Jewish Saturday, is that now the Christian Sunday? What should I do on Sunday? Am I allowed to go golfing? Should I go to a restaurant to eat? These sorts of questions. We've got sidetracked with that, so we've actually missed the main import of what Sabbath is, which is God longs for you to rest. We've missed that. And so we've kept our American identity as overworkers, people who define ourselves by our jobs and our vocations. We've kept that. We focused on, well, you know, uh, I go to church every Sunday. That's great, but it's missing kind of the, the, the larger point of Sabbath, which is, God, there's this deep meaning in creation that God has built in. So we're going to get to that in a minute, but put it off just for a second, if you would, okay? There's two things that God's people do in the Old Testament on Sabbath, and these two things are corporate worship and rest. Corporate worship and rest. So let me just run through this real quick. Corporate worship, first of all, Psalm 92 is a super important text when you're talking about Sabbath because it describes for us what we should be doing on Sabbath, what God's people in the Old Testament, and us too, should be doing on Sabbath. Um, Psalm 92, the heading on it is a psalm, a song for the Sabbath. That was in, th- th- this is in the original Hebrew. It goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's a part of the inspired text. So what that means is that Psalm 92 is describing for us what Sabbath looked like for them in the Old Testament and give us clues for what it should look like for us. So I'm, just gonna re- I'm not going to read the whole thing, just a part of it. Psalm 92, it's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. So praising God is a part of Sabbath. Giving praise to God, we'll be more specific in a minute. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. So to make music, to get together, to get some instruments together and to sing praises to God. It's extremely, I mean, this is why we we sing in church. It's not because, well, it's kind of nice to have a sing-along to give you guys something to do. It's, not, it's commanded by God. This is what we do is we make songs about things that are important to us. This is what every culture does, right? We sing songs, uh, you, you know, uh, when I was growing up, we, sang, you know, we would turn on the Top 40 uh, station and you would hear sappy songs about love because that's what's important in the moment. In the 1990s when I was um, in high school, you turn on the radio and you hear songs about angst and uh, you know, existential crisis, because that's what we, was all, we were all going through. Whatever culture that you're in, that culture is going to make, it could, be, it could be violence, it could be money, it could be romantic love, it could be friendship, it could be patriotic fervor. You know, it's 150 years ago, people would get together and sing songs about how great America was in ways that seem like ironic and goofy and silly now, you know. Uh, when I was a kid, like I said, the, the, the music that was on the radio was all sappy love songs in ways that would be silly in the 1990s, but it's kind of coming back now. And so we make songs about what we love, and God is just basically saying, just do that now, just to come to church and make songs about me. And so um, we do it with music. 
Um, and here's, here's the content of it. So, um, if, you're, if you're in, in Psalm 92 with me, I'm going to start, I'm going to read verse 5. Uh, verse 4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. You see what's happening? God takes the seventh day at the end of the creation week to rejoice over the work that he's done. And now here in Psalm 92, we are taking a Sabbath day to rejoice in the work that God has done. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. So to get together with God's people, more on corporate here in just a second, and to, as verse five there says, to thank and praise God for his works and his thoughts is what Sabbath was all about. To say, God, you do amazing work. God, your thoughts are amazingly deep. So we come together and we read and rejoice over God's word and what God has been doing in our lives and what God has done throughout human history, what God is doing in the world now. It's what Sabbath is about. Numbers 28 says that it's corporate as well. I'm not gonna read this to you, I guess. Um, Numbers 28 verses 9 and 10 prescribe the offerings that should be done in the tabernacle. So if you just read Exodus about Sabbath, you'll be like, okay, so you have to stay in your tent and you can't go out. But you get to Numbers and you're like, no, they actually do go out of their tent. They go to tabernacle and worship. Um, this is a corporate worship is a part of Sabbath as well. Now, I know I have not yet made an argument that Sabbath is the Lord's is Sunday. And I'm not, I'm not really going to actually argue that when we get to the point. But what I am going to say is that corporate worship is super important. It's super important. It's super important to rest in the middle of God's people. And uh, I've said this several times, but I'll, I'll, I'll do this commercial again for, for you guys and for those who are watching at home. Um, so we have the live stream, and we got the live stream going because of uh, COVID. Of course, it was necessary. And we've kept it going because, there's, honestly, I, I just this past week, I was talking to a friend of mine at a track meet who doesn't even go to this church, and he said that somebody, a friend of his who's not a believer has started watching our service. He's told him, like, you should watch this service. And so that's got, that's got deep value to me, that we can use our service as an outreach for people who aren't going to walk into church doors. Also, there are people who are watching right now who can't come to church, who are, uh, you know, homebound or who have health concerns. And so for them, and for, for whenever you are sick, I, look, I, I totally want that to be there. But I, I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to turn the worship service into a consumer good. I don't want you to think of the worship service, and, and, and some of us have, and we're kind of coming out of that, so this is good. But some of us have started thinking of worship service in the same terms that we think of like our Hulu account or our Netflix account, like, you know, it's right there, YouTube, you pop it on, you consume church, that's great, now I've done that, and I'll, you know, I'll catch up on my other shows later this afternoon. And what I don't want to do is, one of the things I'm going to argue against this week and the next two ser sermons on this is that consumerism, which is the bedrock of who we are as Americans, cuts right at the heart of who God wants us to be. We're not to be consumers, we're to be worshipers. And so to worship with God's people is very, very important, Okay. So Sabbath back then was about worship, corporate worship, praising God for his works and his word. But it was also about rest. They were commanded not to work, not to do any work. Them or their animals or their children or their servants, you know, their, 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 their workers, they were not to do any work. Now I'm going to talk way more about rest in the next sermon on this. But let me just give you some preliminary thoughts about this. And I'm going to try to unpack these two weeks from now. So first of all, refuse to be a workaholic. Refuse to be a workaholic. Depend upon God. You know, so being a workaholic is one way that we can say, I've got to do this and I don't need God. I know that a lot of our religion has boiled justification by works down to a religious principle where I'm not trusting in my good deeds to get to heaven. That's not everything that justification by works is about. Justification by works is mainly about you not finding your identity in your work, not finding who you are in your work. And, and, and we, we all do. It's, it's a part of the water that you drink in America and in the West. It's we're, we find out who we are by what we do. We're, we're human doings way more than we're human beings. So if you find yourself saying the following phrases, check yourself on this and tell yourself, I probably need some Sabbath. I probably need some Sabbath. If you find yourself saying, if it's going to get done right, it's going to be left up to me, you probably need Sabbath. If that's what you think, is if for my world to run correctly, I have to do it, then you have definitely made yourself the guiding central principle of your world. Angela and I were sitting on a plane 
several years ago. And I don't remember if this woman was sitting next to us or sitting in the seat behind us, but we still kind of every once in a while laugh about it now. So we're sitting on the tarmac. We're kind of sitting waiting there. And there was this woman sitting behind us who was making quick, repeated phone calls to, in a very loud voice to people who she worked with. And they were all along the lines of, hey, hey, did you see this on the calendar? Okay, just checking. I'll, I'll be back next week. And then she would call somebody else. Hey, did you get that report turned in? I'm just checking. I'll be back next week. She was saying it very loudly and repeatedly. And Angela kind of leaned over me and was like, man, I would hate to work with someone like that. Someone who was like sit, sitting on this plane, but like, I have to check up on all these people. I have to get all this done. What that woman needed was Sabbath. She needed to step back and realize the world will work without you. Because there's a God who makes the world work without us. We need Sabbath, okay? If you find yourself saying this, if I stop working, things are going to get so backed up on me. If you find yourself saying this, what you've done is you've capitulated to this cycle of like, I have to get things done. I have to be busy. I mentioned this in, in a, a sermon several weeks ago. But we have an idol of, uh, and Kate, Kate and I read this book called Seculosity, which is really good. Uh, Corey pointed this book out to me. And one of the things he says in there is um, busyness has become an idol in America. And it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of a nice handy code to say, I worship work. Do you worship work? So if you come and you, and you say to me, Aaron, how, how are things going? I, I almost never say, great. I almost always say, great, really busy, but things are going well. And it's, it's almost impossible to, to like answer the question, how are things going as an American without saying, Really busy, but great, you know, or I'm not struggling, it's really busy. But you have to put something about being busy in there. Why is that? Why is it that it's so important for us to signal to each other, I'm busy, you're busy, we're all busy? Why is it? Because we worship at the altar of work. We've made doing our vocations the primary goal. And most of us in here worship God, but we've turned God into a goal to get to the primary goal, which is to be successful producers and uh, service providers in our economy, or to be, you know, to be successful homemakers, or to be successful cares for our lawn, or to be successful t-ball coaches, or whatever it is. We've turned ourselves into little busy human doing machines in order to like worship at the God of work, and what we need is Sabbath. If you find yourself saying this, I've got to work harder because I've got to get ahead, you need Sabbath, because you should know by now you all have been awake, you've watched commercials, you've watched the, the economic cycles, even in our country you've watched these economic cycles, to know enough to know that there's no such thing as getting ahead. You know this, right? If you think that there is such a thing as getting ahead, you need Sabbath. There's no such thing as getting ahead. There is no ahead to get to. It's always more. This is an interesting, fa interesting fact is that, you know, so during World War II, my grandmother, like uh, your grandmothers and some of your mothers, started working because the men were off at war. And uh, when the war was over and they came back, the women were like, well, this is good money. And the husbands were like, well, it's good money. Let's both work. Which, which by the way, is fine. I'm not, this is not about, like, I'm, it's, it's, Proverbs 31 is very much in favor of women who can produce and can work. I'm not arguing against any sort of thing. Like, we need to get back to, like, the single worker household. I'm not saying that at all, but what I am saying is this, is that did that help people get ahead? No, it didn't, because now there's two incomes up in a home, and you would think, okay, that's more money for us, but you know what happens is just prices rise, because companies raise prices, because now there's more money to be had, and so we can raise the prices. And so the, the, more that you, the harder that you work and the more money that you make, the higher the cost of everything goes up, and that's our culture's way of saying you should get, now, you guys know this too, is advertisers are always trying to convince you that you can get ahead, but that's just a hamster wheel. That's the way they make money, is by convincing you to work harder to make more money so that you can spend more money on goods and services. And what we need in our culture is Sabbath. We need to stop and say, no, I'm not working today. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be owned by this. And I don't know if any of you are, are challenged by this and pushing back on this. And you're gonna, you're, maybe you're thinking things like, oh, maybe he's like trying to sneak laziness in the back door. And all these sort of like American things that we tell us to convince us that like consumerism is good. And I'm just, well, I'm going to argue probably more, uh, more emphatically uh, two weeks from now. What I'm going to try to argue this is that the, the entire culture that you live in is geared to take away Sabbath from you. It's to say, do not rest. Do not trust in God. You need to work harder. You need to work better. You need to work more efficiently because the entire culture that we live in is geared towards making money. 
And you and I have become cogs in that machine. And God is trying to pull you off that hamster wheel and say, you don't need to work, my child. I'm giving you every good thing. Now, this does not mean at all that work's not important. Remember, God rests on the seventh day because work is important. He wants to value it. More on that in just a second. If we don't play in this tournament, my kid isn't going to get the scholarship or be able to spend time with his friends, etc. I hope that you guys know what you're doing to your kids. This is my, my, my kids are the same way, too. Like, I'm serious. This is not me speaking down from the mountain to you. Like, I'm on the hamster wheel, too. We're crushing our kids. We've taken things that were designed for rest and enjoyment, like baseball, and we're turning them into, this is a tool for you to make money someday. Work hard. Get good at this. Maybe you can get a scholarship and it'll help save us money. You can go to a better school. These sorts of things. If you find yourself, especially if you find yourself saying, I'm going to step away from Sunday worship because of soccer or baseball or whatever it is, ballet or whatever it is that you're doing, what, what you need is Sabbath. You've committed to this cycle of like, I have to work, I have to do in order to find value, in order to find meaning. And what we need is Sabbath. God longs to pull you into himself so that you can rest with his people in his work. That's the first thing. Refuse to be a workaholic. Second thing is this. Celebrate Sabbath. I'm not devaluing work at all. What I'm trying to do is elevate work. All right? You know what? The, the, the American system devalues work. I'll show you why in a second. If you want to really value who you are and what you do, learn to celebrate Sabbath. Learn to, to be able to stop and say, God, you've given me good gifts. You enjoy what I've done in your name. I'm going to enjoy what, what, what I'm doing in your name as well. So there's two bad options here that our culture pulls us into. One bad option is this. Work existing as an absolute value. You need to be a hard worker. Why? Because hard work is good. So, so let the hearer understand. This is a, a, another one of my uh, Gen X illustrations. Uh, uh, don't, don't put a hand up, but some of you will know who doozers are. Doozers are characters on Fraggle Rock. All right, so Fraggle Rock is, a, is a, a, a Jim Henson show. It's got Muppets and stuff. And I don't want to tell you the whole story, but in, in, in Fraggle Rock, there's these characters called doozers. They're little tiny guys, and they build these edible towers. And if you ask a doozer, why are you building the edible tower, the doozer will say, because that's what we do. We only, we, we only, we live to work. That's who we are. And the Fraggles, who are like your typical Muppet-type creatures, I'm like, I got to talk down to those of you who don't get the 1980s, like some of, the, some of the, the, the right thinking ones of you do. They eat these edible towers because they're delicious. And sometimes some of the fraggles will be like, well, that's cruel to eat the work that the doozers are doing. And the doozers will say, no, we need you to eat that so that we have more space to keep on doing this. There's one episode where the fraggles decide we're not going to eat their, we're going to honor them by not eating their work. And then the doozers have to plan to move out of the cave because it's filled completely with these constructions that they've made. A lot of us have become doozers, where we just do. We just build. Why? Because good work is valuable. And what I'm saying is stop and have Sabbath so that you can actually value. You know what that does? That turns work into an ultimate value and strips it of its meaning. There's no point in building those towers for the doozers. They don't actually do anything. It's just a hamster wheel that they're on. But if you can stop and you can look back and value what you've done. Now, I'm going to pause here and just say this. Some of you are like, I can't do that. I work in the corporate world or I work in a cubicle or I work at a factory. I'm going to talk next week about this, okay? About what is it like to work in a job where there really is no sort of apparent value to what you do. We'll talk about that next week, all right, or two, two weeks from now. But for right now, just don't, don't be a doozer. It, the, being a doozer Working hard for the sake of working hard devalues the work that you do because it absolutizes the actual working. And it uh, relativizes the actual product or the service that you do or the taking care of the people that you take care of. Don't be like that. Here's the second bad option. The everybody's working for the weekend option, right? Is why do you go to work? You go to work to make money so that you can get to Saturday and Sunday and relax and have a good time. You don't really like what you do. There's really meaning or purpose in it, but you need the money to have the good time on Saturday and Sunday. And what I would say is that it's nice that you're having a good time on Saturday and Sunday, but the rest of your life is miserable, or maybe not miserable, but just meaningless, because what you've done is you've fallen for the everybody's working for the weekend culture, which our consumerist corporate culture wants you to fall for, because that's how they make money off of you. But do you, you see how this relativizes your work? It only exists to provide 
pleasure on the weekends to you. And what Sabbath does is says, no, you need to stop and enjoy what you've done. Enjoy the people that you've ministered to. Enjoy the products that you've made. Enjoy the clients that you've served and how you've served them and how you've been, whatever it is. This is what Sabbath does. So it values work more than the workaholic culture does, which just needs you to do work in order for it to make money. And what Sabbath does is say, no, your work is actually important in God's eyes because God sanctifies work and blesses it by enjoying it himself. You can only do this with Sabbath. Only Sabbath will allow you to have a vocation that brings honor and glory, specifically honor and glory to God in, in, in your worship. Okay, let's make this real practical and then I'll be done. Sidebar here. Can I, I told you I was going to do this. I wasn't planning on doing this a couple weeks ago, but I decided I had to. What does Old Testament Sabbath have to do with New Testament Sunday? Because they worshiped on Saturday. We worship on Sunday. What's going on there? Does the New Testament tell us to worship on Sunday? The answer is no, it doesn't. The New Testament never says, okay, Sabbath is over. Now we're moving the Sabbath to the first day of the week. So what are we going to make of this? First of all, why did they move? Why, why did the early Christian church start worshiping on Sunday? One reason I'm just going to touch on and then move on. Uh, probably because... Sabbath had become an ethnic badge. It had become like circumcision or the kosher law as a way of saying, I am God's people, I'm a Jew, and you are not. And so the church gets rid of it because it doesn't function the way it's supposed to. It becomes sort of a badge of pride. It becomes a works righteousness thing instead of a gift that God gives us to benefit ourselves. More on the gospels next week and how the gospel works with this. But here's what I want to focus on real quick. Maybe God isn't ultimately interested in a single specific day. Maybe God just wants you to learn to rest with his people and worship him. Maybe God, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe the day itself isn't important. You're free to, like, I, I, Sunday is not a day of rest for me. It is for many of you, and you should use it as a day of rest. It's not for me. It doesn't mean that Sabbath doesn't exist for me. Maybe it doesn't for you as well. For those of you who are medical professionals, frequently, Sabbath, Sunday is not a Sabbath for you. For those of you who have other jobs that like get called in on an emergency or something, what you should do instead is find some day where you can stop and say, God does good work, I'm gonna enjoy it. God does good work through me. I'm gonna stop and enjoy what he's done through me. I'm gonna worship him through my work, through enjoying what I've done in my work this week. We're free to make Sabbath where it best serves us. Sunday happened to be the place that made sense to the early church because it, like we just sang in that hymn, it was the day when God created light. It was the day when Jesus rose from the dead. It was the day when God poured his Holy Spirit out on his people. Let's meet on Sabbath day. Uh, let's meet on Sundays and make it then. But it is important to take a day of rest and enjoy what God has done. So to have this attitude towards creation and vocation that says this, I do it for God. God does it through me and I do it so that I can stop and I can enjoy what God is doing through me. That's what Sabbath is all about. I'll unpack more next week. Let me give you three things real quick. Today, if today is your Sabbath, which for many of us it is, it's nice that our culture still gives most of us Sundays off. It's a great day to come and meet with God's people, to, to uh, be thankful for his work and his word, to hang out with each other, to do whatever it is that gives rest to you. I don't want to give too many specifics, but I, um, one guy I read said this, if it's work for you, don't do it on your Sabbath. So, Yard work for me would be work. I did, this would not be a good idea for me to do that. For some of you, though, yard work would be like, that would be how you relax. So do it, right? Whatever helps you be thankful to God and rest and recuperate, along with being with his people in the morning. But enjoy what God has done for you in creation. Spend today, go home today, and enjoy what God has done for you in creation. Maybe that's food. Maybe that's family. Maybe that's nature. Maybe that's a sport. Maybe that's going swimming, whatever it is that you can do to say, God, you've made this incredible world. You've made me. I'm going to enjoy you, you through it. So some, this is, some people are like, so, yeah, this doesn't sound very religious though, you know? Like, other people go swimming. Other people play golf. Other people eat good food. What's different? Well, yeah, what's different about us is that we can eat good food and play golf and go swimming and hang out with our family and say, that's totally a gift of God. We can turn those things into worship because we know about the God who works to make Sabbath. And so we can as well. Enjoy what God has done in your weekly work. You, whoever you are, you should stay. However much you love your job or hate your job, you need to spend some time today 
thinking back to this week about what you've done and who you've served and be thankful for that. And if you can't, well, we can talk about that in two weeks. We can talk about that in two weeks. But to stop and be thankful. Don't, be, don't, don't, don't think, well, they needed a, this is the American way to think. They needed a service or they needed a product. They had money. They gave it to me. I provided the service and the product. And so there's nothing wrong with that system in and of itself. But to dehumanize us by turning us self into consumers and producers is not what God wants. We have a responsibility to love and serve our neighbor. And so when your client is served by you, think about that. Be grateful to God that he gave you somebody made in his image to take care of and to serve this week. Spend some time doing that. And finally, enjoy especially what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. This should be the height. This is the apex of the work that God has done that on Sabbath we should stop and say, that's amazing, God. Thank you for doing that. We we read in the gospel reading, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we read in the gospel reading the story of the, the, the burial of Jesus and then his resurrection. And some of you notice that last line of chapter 23. On the Sabbath, the women rested according to the commandment. They rested, actually, it says, according to the commandment. That's a great line. It's the reason why Jesus died on a Friday and rested on this Sabbath, because it was finished. He had done all the work that God had sent him to do. He didn't just rise from the dead. He didn't just die on the cross, and they buried him, and like, bingo, there he is. Wow, this is great. He takes a day, the Sabbath day, to stop and rest. Whatever else Jesus is doing on that day, and the Bible says little about it, little, some, but little, one of the things he's doing is he's enjoying the work that he's done. For the early church, it's like a day of angst, of despair. We've lost. But think about, and I don't know what Satan is thinking, but think about what the Trinity is thinking on that Easter Saturday. They're thinking we did it. We had a plan. We did the plan. The world is saved. Let's pause 24 hours and kind of sit in this and be grateful for this and enjoy it. And the women and the disciples don't know they're doing it, but they're getting that Sabbath as well. And the next day, it's a new week. Jesus has risen from the dead. Let's get to work. There's a Sabbath still in the future. That'll be the third sermon, the Sabbath in the future. But today, today, don't be a consumer. Don't be a producer. Be a faithful member of God's church, made in his image, designed by him to work for his glory and for your pleasure and for the pleasure and benefit of the people around you. And then on this, one day a week, stop and just rest and be grateful to God for all of that. Amen.
stand for prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us and for being a good God. And we thank you for uh, being a God who rests, for a God who's not a slave driver, for a God who's not a slave, for a God who makes beautiful works and thinks beautiful thoughts and says beautiful words and then pauses to enjoy them and invites us to pause and enjoy those things as well. Father, give us rest in you. Give us hope in you. Father, may our stated belief as Christians that we believe the justification is by grace through faith, may it work its way down into our actual lives, Father, so that we stop striving, stop finding our meaning and our work and the things that we do and the things that we accomplish, but find our identity in your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you would be with all of us who are uh, struggling this morning with health issues and with uh, uh, mourning the loss of loved ones and with um, uh, relationships that are strained and some relationships that are broken. And some of us who are struggling with our jobs, Father, discontent, uh, being underemployed, uh, not finding meaning and purpose in our jobs. Uh, for those of us who are struggling with mental health issues, Father, and anxiety and depression and worry, would you be with all of us and meet us where we're at? You, you know how desperately we're in need of you, God. And, and while our culture tells us that we can solve these problems on our own, we come together this morning to freely confess to you that we know that we cannot. And we need your grace and we need your love and we need the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray especially this morning that you would give comfort and hope to the family of Ken Cober who passed away this week and that you would help them and all of us to firmly believe in the power of your son's resurrection and to know that you are determined to make all things new. Lord, in your mercy. We pray these things because you are a good God and you have brought us into your Sabbath rest and we can come into your throne room and ask, ask you whatever we want and you've invited us to do that because you love us and in your son Jesus Christ, you've called us your daughters and sons and so we pray this in his name, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us, given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But mainly we're bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, for he is the true Passover Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy. together in Jesus' name the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
stand. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in Christ's peace. Amen. Bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. If you want to do the men's Bible study on Proverbs, uh, the books are up here. Uh, grab one out of the boxes sitting on the front pew. If you'd like to pray with somebody, you can come forward after the service and there'll be somebody to pray with you up here. Look around and find somebody you don't recognize and start to build that relationship with them. Go in peace.